Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I think we'd do a little better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Godfrey Bethia. I, am, I work with the CEIR working group um, with uh, Tim Stevens and other great professionals on the working group. Uh, within my day job, I work for the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank. I am the vice president of Equity, People, and Culture, which I head up both uh, HR services and our um, equity, diversity, inclusion initiatives for the food bank. Uh, it is my honor to be here uh, this morning speaking to such a large group of uh, Southwestern PA leaders, um, equity advocates, and others who just like to have hot breakfast in the morning. So. <laughs> Being... Um, being passed around right now, you should, you should have a, 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 a document uh, that is detailing the initiative of the CEIR working group. It is a one-page document uh, that will hopefully be circulated across uh, the Southwestern PA region, across organizations, corporations. It's, it states that the Corporate Equity and Inclusion Roundtable, the CEIR, is sponsoring a project called the Black Pittsburgh Satisfaction and Retention Survey. The purpose of this initiative uh, is to collect data and insights um, on the attitudes in the black, of the black working population in and from the Pittsburgh region so that we as the region can have a deeper understanding of the region's underrepresented population. And we just talked about, you know, stopping the loss of the population. I think this initiative will help us understand uh, where, that, where that loss is happening. And although we may know or, or personally experience life in Pittsburgh, we are attempting to do something that is very audacious as, as a region and collective voices and learning to why some of the, some of the black and African Americans stay in the region, why others decide to leave the region, and collect the, the collection of this data will provide valuable insights uh, to employers, community leaders, organizations, other supporting service organizations, and align with regional leaders' efforts and missions of the organization to achieve the advancement of economic advancement of black working population. This information will create an enormous learning opportunity that supports local organization efforts in attracting and retaining the talent in the region. And just as we talked about, it might help our, some of our organizations reach their, their diversity targets, like Dr. Mr. Flanagan was talking about. Uh, we intend uh, for this panel discussion to be an interactive panel session with live polling questions. Um, so please pull out your phone. If you have your phone, please pull it out, or if you're using a computer, it's fine. Go to the web browser and go to menti.com. You can see it on the screen, menti.com. So we're going to make this interactive. And use the code on the screen. We will poll the audience with three questions. That will be similar to the, this is going to be similar to the information that will be collected in a survey when it is launched. And today's exercise will give us an, an indication of the type of information we can expect to receive through the, when the data is collected. And so while you're doing this on your phone, I'm going to introduce our panelists to the stage while you're working on that. So I'm going to introduce the panelists to, uh, right now. Uh, they can come to the stage. Our first panelist is Atlant Harrell. He is the Director of Workforce Development, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion with the Master Builders Association of Western PA. Our next panelist is Shelley Hammond, Vice President of Programs with the Advancement Leadership Institute, TALI. Our next panelist is Dr. Kyan Connor. Director of Center on Race and Social Problems, Associate Dean for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion with the University of Pittsburgh. And our final panelist, Don Crosby, Director of Staffing and Business Development with Earn Staffing Solution. So welcome to our panelists. So we're going, to, we're going to start with the first live poll question, okay? If you have your phones ready, go to menti.com, enter the code. Here's the first question. 
What is the primary reason you stay in the Pittsburgh region? What is the primary reason you stay in the Pittsburgh region? And our results are coming in. I believe you can, you can sequence these and rate and rank them. We'll give you one minute. As the results are in, we're going to pause there. I mean, you can still keep coming in, but we're going to see what we got up here. Coming at number one is family and social networks in the region. Cost of living came in at number two. Professional opportunities just jumped to number two. Neighborhood, safe and welcoming to your family, and so on. All right, school system, we have regional and industrial connections satisfied with quality of life in the region, enjoyed regional amenities. Health systems and other support systems, support functions came in last. So welcome, panelists. A lot of great information here. This, this on the surface, family and, and social networks are still coming in, number one. Um, as, as mentioned uh, by some of the statistics, part of the CEIR's purpose is to achieve higher levels of inclusion of African Americans in employment and business ownership, business development, Pittsburgh and uh, in southwestern Pennsylvania region. But since 1970, this region has seen a downward decline in population. As a matter of fact, Allegheny County, or Allegheny, Beaver, Fayette, Green counties, each lost 6%, 0.6%, and 1.5% of its population in 2021. So the question to the panelists, and I'll start from, from your left to the right, is what is your organization focusing on regarding supporting African Americans in the Pittsburgh region and the Southwestern PA region? But before you answer that question, we also want to know, are you a Pittsburgh native? Born, in Pittsburgh, born and raised in Pittsburgh, transplanted to Pittsburgh, or a boomerang, left and came back to the region. So the question again is, what is your organization doing to support African Americans in the Pittsburgh region? Well, my name is Dawn Clisby. I work for Earn Staffing Solutions. It is an African American owned um, staffing executive search company. What we are doing is attracting and retaining diverse talent within the city, whether we're attracting them outside or promoting them from inside. And how we do that is with our fair hiring equity practices, where we align with organizations that aren't just checking the box. They're really wanting to align with the values and principles of diversifying their, their talent and their team. And so what we do is try to make psychological safe places when they're interviewing through their interviewing process and along with that aligning with the hiring managers with these organizations just as it was mentioned on the video it does have to come in from the top to the bottom the buy-in really has to be in at the top and the who what where when and why of these organizations need to be dug into in order to understand that the values are aligned, but it's also important to do your 30, 60, 90 day um, and ask the client and the candidate questions so that you'll make sure that you're aligned and so that that commitment and that talent retains within that organization um, by asking questions, digging in, finding out what's important, understanding it, and being able to have different 
activities and things that are going to keep them engaged. Okay. Now, are you born and raised in Pittsburgh? Yes, I'm born and raised in Pittsburgh. Yes, and I stayed because of family and because if you don't see the change, um, you have to, if you want to see the change, you have to be around and make the impact. So that's why I stayed. Thank you. Dr. Kaya? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I will start, I guess, with my story because it leads into why I came back and what I think that the Center on Race and Social Problems is doing to address some of these issues. So I am a transplant and a boomerang. Um, originally born in uh, Seattle, Washington, moved across the West Coast to the East Coast. My father is a hospital administrator and was the first black man to hold every position he had. So to get promoted, we had to move. Um, so I've lived in about 16 different cities. Um, until I came to Pittsburgh for education. And I've lived in Pittsburgh longer than I've lived anywhere else because I was in school for so long. Um, and once I got my PhD and did uh, some postdoctoral training, um, I did leave. Um, and I left for a few different reasons. Um, I was concerned about raising three black boys in the city of Pittsburgh at the time. I had experienced some pretty significant racism in the city including some of the neighborhoods that I lived in. I had friends who refused to come to visit me in certain places where I lived here. Um, and I was concerned about my own upward mobility. So I did move uh, for 10 years. Uh, and I came back, and I've been here for about three and a half months now, um, because of another professional opportunity. So the University of Pittsburgh really saw, um, I think, something special in me and were willing to go out on a limb and bring me back as a full professor and as an endowed chair, which I'm actually one of very few full professor endowed chair black women at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and there needs to be more. Um, and to be the director of the Center on Race and Social Problems. So this center was developed uh, 20 years ago by our former dean and director, uh, Dr. Larry E. Davis, who was also my mentor. Uh, this was a man who inspired me to get my doctorate when I didn't think that I had the capability to be able to do that work, never saw myself as a researcher, but he believed in me. So that piece about mentorship and pulling people up is so important. We have to do that for each other. Um, the Center on Race and Social Problems was one of the first centers of its kind to be on a college campus, certainly in a school of social work. It's one of the crowns and the jewel of what we have in this city because this center really is focused on dismantling oppression and racism. And we do that in a variety of different ways. Um, one is through research and scholarship. So we do work to better understand disparities that are impacting black and brown communities in Pittsburgh across a variety of different areas, from education to uh, workforce, uh, health, mental health, school system, criminal justice, all of these areas. We continue to see significant disparities across the board for our communities. Our center is striving to better understand why and to begin looking at evidence-based solutions to address those problems step by step. Um, we also have a lot of training opportunities. Uh, Rana Doko, who many of you likely know, is running our Racial Equity Consciousness Institute, which we're identifying as one of the vaccines for racism. It really targets bias, implicit bias, systemic racism. And we're working to train as many people in the region around this because that does have an impact. Bias, discrimination, oppression impacts all the social determinants of health, including access to education and workforce opportunities. So this work is really critical. Um, we are also doing a lot of work with students. We talked about this. I was one of those students who came to Pitt and then left. A lot of our students are doing that because they don't see opportunities for their mobility to stay here. We want to change that too. We also have to work to ensure that when we bring people here, we've got enough to sustain them so that they're happy and healthy here. The university has always sort of had a focus on bringing in recruit recruiting, but then how do we retain? How do we make people feel like they belong? And uh, so that's the work that we're doing at the Center on Race and Social Problems. And I hope to get to partner with more of you as we continue this important work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Potter. Shelly? Hi, yes, my name is Shelly Hammond. I'm with the Advanced Leadership Institute. And that's a loaded question in regards to where you're from. <laughs> so uh, like you, I've got to tell probably a little bit more background around here. I'm third generation military. 
Uh, with that being said, my grandfather served. My grandfather and my grandmother migrated here to uh, Pittsburgh from Virginia. They both were college educated in the 1800s. They had 10 children, all of which afforded the opportunity for a college education. And again, people boomeranging in and out because are you really going to get that opportunity here? Uh, I know my grandfather was uh, the first black man to hold a corporate contract. He had a contract actually with Sears. And again, um, you're seeing more and more information come out in regards to accurate history. Uh, Hampton Institute, Tuskegee Eaters, a whole bunch of schools, they weren't built just to accommodate my grandparents. I'm fairly certain of that. So find that out for yourself. Uh, with that being said, my, both of my parents were born here in Pittsburgh. My father was 82nd Airborne Army. My grandfather was Army. I went Air Force. And uh, is anybody here, how many people here know Wilkinsburg? You know Wilkinsburg, you went to Wilkinsburg. I graduated from Wilkinsburg High School. On what planet was a little black girl graduating from Wilkinsburg going to be able to fly? It's never going to happen here. So I raised my hand. I got commissioned as an officer in the United States Air Force. I mastered my uh, flying credentials. My first assignment was with NASA. Uh, served through Desert Storm. Came back here uh, for an opportunity and to have my daughter go through a decent school system at the time. My daughter's a computer programmer. She's in your old stomping grounds in Seattle because when she's getting ready to graduate, she had four job offers on the table. One was leading something with a financial institution in Philadelphia, one in San Diego, one in Seattle. Here in Pittsburgh, she was offered a job at a help desk. And don't get me wrong, it's a good job, but she sold her second tech company before she was 30. So again, we don't, and the reason why I share that, we just can't. At, here at Pittsburgh, we're just stuck in imagining bigger. We don't think to consider that somebody that looks like us is going to run something in tech or is going to work through the higher levels of the banking industry. And that's where predominantly my career was across the banking industry. And I still remember applying for a position. I'm sitting across from a lady. This is after probably a year or two, just getting out of Desert Storm. And she looked at me and she said, you know, you're really good, but you don't have any leadership experience. How's that work? <laughs> so, but okay, I'm, I'm, okay, let's do that. So again, uh, I work for the Advanced Leadership Institute. You see a number of our alumni sitting in here. And you know, the point behind the Advanced Leadership Institute is to cultivate black executive leadership within our communities, our institutions, and our, our companies. And I'm going to take that one step further. What that means authentically, and when someone's really bought into that, that means that you have a seat at a table with the authority and the autonomy to make decisions over policies, over the money that's being spent, over the personnel that are being hired. You have decision making unquestioned around doing those things. And that's critical. I would love to see more for-profit boards pull that curtain back, make a bigger effort to have people of color on those boards. And I do know the organizations are working really hard to do that. Same thing with our for-profit companies. There has to be a more concerted effort in regards to having people of color fill a number of these positions because that's when you get really, really smart. You get really smart because you have a much broader insight in regards to how to serve your customer in, reg in regards to how it is that your company can effectively and efficiently make money. And that's just absolutely critical. But again, the first thing we have to do is get rid of the paradigm that nobody that looks like me could make a bank billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. But I didn't have enough experience. <laughs> so that is my story. I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lance Harrell. I work for the group called the Masters Builders Association of Western Pennsylvania. Um, that's probably like a new term, and no one never heard of MBA. But we are a construction trade group here in Western PA. Uh, we actually represent about, we have about 263 members that do about 80% of all the commercial construction. Uh, right behind us, FB and Tower, our members are building that. Uh, right across the street for the new expansion for Duquesne University, our members are building that. So once again, 80% of all the commercial construction is built by our members. My role with MBA is diversity, equity, inclusion, workforce development, how we build out more individuals to go into these construction trades. There's 16 unions out there. 
Um, a little while ago, I came across a documentary by a gentleman by the name of Nate Smith. Some of you may be familiar with him from the 1960s, right? If you ever have a chance, please, you have to go to Robert Morris University. They have the documentary. It's called What Does Trouble Look Like? Sixty years later, we're still dealing with the same challenges that Nate Smith and the other individuals that he worked with were fighting back then. So it's crazy that 60 years later, nothing has changed. Same thing. I told our members, as you imagine, if you had a, a portfolio that you invested in, and after 60 years later, you had no return, right? And that's the, I'm sorry, that's the challenge that we're dealing with, right? Um, but my role is, like I said, how we get more of us into the trades, how we build out more minority contractors who can work on these projects. But not even that, but how we actually get more, more of us into an architect, an engineer, a project manager, safety director. Not many of us know that at Slippery Rock University, they have a top-notch safety program. Safety is huge in this industry. So how we connect these dots of opportunity is what we're really working on, and that's the reason, that's the role I'm in, and that's what we're trying to expand on. Um, born and raised in Pittsburgh, graduated from Bashir High School, uh, went to CCAC, played with Coach Shea, then I went over to Point Park. And the reason why I stayed was because of family. Um, sometimes I do regret not leaving Pittsburgh because my friends who left Pittsburgh are doing much better. I'm pretty sure everybody in the audience had either had a friend or a relative who went to D.C., who went to Virginia, who went to Houston, who went to Atlanta. And when you go see them and you go to a community where, yeah, you can actually go into a black community that is $40 million homes or plus. And we always kind of regret that. Why can't we actually have a black shady side? Why can't we have a black score hill? So. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, everyone. Um, I didn't mention that I am a transplant to, to Pittsburgh. I've been in Pittsburgh about 17 years now. I uh, came to Pittsburgh for an employment opportunity and since, uh, you know, went through a couple different organizations here in the Pittsburgh region. But, um, you know, one of the things is, is trailing spouses and my wife has brought my family here and, you know, that's one of the things that she's, she's one of the folks that's really chiming about leaving Pittsburgh at the moment, right? Um, finding her sense of community here. So, you know, that's really important for employers to understand some of the challenges uh, that it's not just that professional that comes here, it's just the family and their support, the school they go into, where they go to the place of worship, where they go to barber or, or beauty salons. That's important as well. That leads into the next question. So if you get your phones out, <clears throat> the next polling question here will be, what are the challenges? faced by African Americans in the Pittsburgh, in the Pittsburgh region. I think you can only select one. <laughs> so the strongest opinion. Give you a couple more seconds. <laughs> okay. It's very telling, all right? Very telling. And it goes to what I said earlier. We made no individually. We know specifically know why. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're the feeling or perception of living in the Pittsburgh region. But this is the information, uh, the rich inf type of information we can get from a survey, so that you know employers in this region can really understand the challenges faced by professionals when they're trying to not only recruit but retain the talent. Um, next question, and I'm gonna start with you, Lance, to come back this way if you don't mind. Um, what are what opportunities do you see for African American population in the region, and vice versa? Um, so the the, the, the uh, sorry the opportunities and what are the challenges that you see impacting African Americans uh, population in the region? Okay, thank you. Uh, the first thing is the data that you're collecting. Will you be able to share that? Yes. 
okay? Because that's something I definitely want to share with my board, All right? Um, so the first thing is the racism everybody agrees upon. But you think about how many, so many other things falls underneath that, which I actually I'll talk in my presentation, but from the racism comes the education. Actually, I'll, I'll talk in my slide about the, the performance for our schools in the Pittsburgh, Aliquippa, Penn Hills, that due to the racism, our schools are underperforming. And until we actually address the, the racism slash the education, we can't stop the bleeding. I mean, that is the biggest challenge. I know that when I go to different schools and I talk about going to the trades, there actually there's an aptitude test. A lot of young men and women and adults can't pass these exams. So even though you walk across the stage at the age of 17, 18 with a diploma, it's just a piece of paper, right? That when they get into the real world, they don't have the skills. But there's so many other things that's just not the education, but I'm not, I'm not an educator, I'm not a social worker, but I know there's things impacting the household that the young men and women can't perform academically. So I don't know collectively, until we find a solution for that, we can't stop the bleeding. But that is the biggest hurdle. It, it, it is the education. That's the reason why so many of us leave is because one is the racism and then we don't wind up leaving the young folks, young men and women don't see someone like them in those positions, right? If you get into the trades, I'll give you an example, right? You don't see a business owner. You don't see a foreman. You don't see a superintendent. So the only thing you'll see is that, yeah, I can be a skilled carpenter. I can be a skilled uh, plumber, but I can't advance in this industry because there's no one else there who looks like me. So yeah, it would be the racism slash education. It is the biggest hurdle for us. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, I'm gonna jump on and uh, thank you. That was perfect lead in for that. <laughs> jump in in regards to that. You know, here's the other piece to all of that. And I'm gonna beg every single person in this room to make a commitment to this. We, we have to help each other to get that curtain pulled back. Um, you know, if you go back and, and to your point, there seems to be this just continued underlying thought that there's lack. So if you succeed, then that must mean I'm missing something or there's something I'm not going to get. That's not true. My grandmother used to say, if we're all moving up the steps and we run out of steps because we're all sitting at the top, build more steps. And that, that's absolutely true. We have to, and that starts with us, but also to just spreading it more broadly. The only way to change that is through the education. I know throughout the course of my career, there were points where I was thinking, oh, I'm doing really, really good. And then somebody pulls the customer, pulls the curtain back, and you realize, wow, I should have been getting stock options. Oh, I should have been in this pay bracket. And, and again, people knowingly keep doing that. And that's the piece that has to stop. And of course, the answer is then, oh, well, you can't make a jump from this to this. You'd have to leave the company and come back. And, and again, I get that there's some, uh, when you think from a budget standpoint, from an HR standpoint, legal standpoint, I get all the parameters around that. But if we start in the right spot to begin with, that's the key piece. The more that we have organizations, and I know for me personally through Tally, it is just absolutely critical that we're engaging in those conversations. We're talking about um, how it is that we focus and present from a business standpoint the things that we're going after. We have the smarts to do that, but sometimes by the time it actually happens and you get in that conversation, you've been pushed so far over the edge, it's like, look, do I even really need to be here anymore? And that, that obviously isn't the thing that's going to get you in the role. But again, unless we are putting our arms around each other to help each other to share that knowledge, to share that experience, and to your point, continue to get educated about those spaces we're in, that's going to always be the excuse as to why we're not in those spaces. So, you know, back to leaving and coming back. I've left Pittsburgh and come back a number of times. I've had the absolute privilege of living around the world. My daughter was born outside of London. And you do, you see that there's so much more of the world that functions normally, if you will, or at least where there's a better opportunity. We can change that here. We can absolutely change that here. But I'm going to go back to what Godfrey said, a large portion of it is, how do we expand our professional communities here and be very, very intentionally inclusive in regards to how we pull people into that so that you, I can't wait to work for you when you're a CEO. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. And that's the catch. We should be investing in each other to do so. So, thank you. I agree uh, with what uh, the other members of the panel have stated. I think I'll also want to talk about health uh, and mental health um, as a clinician. Uh, we are in a mental health crisis right now. Um, 
and certainly that is impacted by systemic racism, right? Racism is a public health crisis, we know that, but we are really seeing the impact of that in our communities and particularly among our young people and particularly in school and particularly among black youth. Uh, we are seeing some of the highest rates of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. For the first time in history, uh, death by suicide is rising more among black youth than it has other groups. We've not seen that before. Um, we are not doing enough to address that issue in the school system right now because that is impacting the trajectories of our young people, which is impacting their ability to graduate and then impacting their ability to enter the workforce. All of these things are, con are connected. I think that's one of the frustrating things about being a researcher for me is that a lot of our work, particularly around addressing health disparities and health equity, we could have a whole conversation about that, but we know that pretty much every single health issue, disease that you can think of, black people experience it in a disparate way across the board, right? Um, and a lot of our work has been around making sure people have access to care, access to a doctor, access to insurance. But the reality is, while we continue to see that making somewhat of a difference, and it is helping, let me not say that it's not, but if we have inequities in education, if we have inequities in who has access to gainful employment, if we have inequities in who has access to higher education, if we have inequities in who has access to nutritious foods, if we have inequities in who's entering our criminal justice system, then we're gonna continue to have inequities in health and mental health regardless of whether or not everyone has access to care. All of these issues are interconnected, so we need complex strategies that are able to address that systemic racism so that it also then trickles down into all of those other areas, so. Oh, and can I just say about opportunity? As a, as a professor, you know, one of the things that I see as an opportunity are the young people in the institutions, universities, colleges that are here in Pittsburgh. Um, I think we could be doing a whole lot more to keep those folks here. For many of our students, and you mentioned your story with your daughter, they, leave, they, they get here, they're doing amazing things, and then there's no opportunity for them here when they are getting ready to leave. So they end up going someplace else. How can we create more opportunities for our bright minds who are here to stay here and connect better with the community organizations so that our young people have a position here before they even graduate so that they are staying in the region and continuing to build up. So there's a good, great opportunity there that we could do better to capitalize on. Thank you. Thank you. Dawn? Yeah, so in addition to the panel, which brought up several different topics which go in with systemic racism, the health inequities in educational systems and school systems also, another big factor is hiring equity practices and fair equity pay. And where do we go for the resources to even build a better resume? Where do we go to help get coached for behavioral interviewing? Um, what resources do we have or are we utilizing in order to help those that are in the underrepresented community? whether it's the black and brown, whether it's the LGBTQT community, or whether it's war veterans. So the challenge, that, that is the challenge, um, because, but an opportunity for that is to build a pipeline amongst us all. One of Earn's um, motto is working together on purpose. Well, be intentional about it, because if you think about it, they've been intentional for years. So build your pipelines, build your network, um, get a mentor. Um, I know when I was coming up, we had a, a program called Inroads Pittsburgh Erie. Um, not too sure if anybody in the room is familiar with it, but during that time, we had opportunities to and mentors to go to different um, leaderships within these organizations and get trained, whether it's in resume building, um, social etiquette, whether you're going to lunch with, you know, or dinner with the boss or colleagues, things like that. And what Earn tries to do is build um, networks and, and relationships with other organizations that are supporting our black and brown community in, in, in other ways. Because if they communicate something that I can help with, or if I, they can communicate something that we're hiring, it's just that level of support um, communicating um, keeping them informed, 
Um, we try to pair, so if I'm hiring an entry level person that has graduated from college and they're, they have majored in accounting, well, I'm gonna, ment I'm gonna connect him and attach him with the controller that I may have placed at the African American August Wilson Center or whatever, whatever client you connect with the industry that they're in, whether they're starting off entry level or whether someone is a C-suite level. There are ways to build the, and form those relationships and create those bonds so that you will have someone to go to, you will have a resource to, to speak with. So I think that is an opportunity, um, an opportunity where we could all um, uh, improve and, and increase. And as far as challenges, um, there are many challenges as far as the hiring equity uh, practices and as far as fair equity. However, um, we, we are coming a ways, um, I will tell you, from the earned staffing solution perspective, there are things that, since I've been on this journey, has been very eye-opening, but there are some wins that are really happening out there for us that I'm really, really proud of and it involves educational background because every time you see a C-suite position, your, your automatic requirement obviously is your education, your background, um, you know, a degree. Well, Pittsburgh is improving, you know, I'm not saying we, we still have a long way to go, even other cities and states have a long way to go. But what I've seen here is something um, very, very excellent um, so just because someone does, may not have the educational background, utilize the experience that you have. Um, not saying that you would need an advocate along the way, um, as earn advocates for their talent that may lack one of those requirements that are in a job description. Um, we're looking more at insight on the culture and to make sure that it's a cultural fit for that individual. Because that's also another reason why they stay. The reason why, well, how do I feel? How do I belong in this organization? Do I feel valued? Um, um, do I feel as I have, I have a future here? These are the things that you have to think about and the organizations need to think about in order to retain that as well. So thank you. You all are such a great set of panelists. You answered all of my questions that I had coming up. For so in the interest of time, we're going to have one more polling question, and then we're going to have a lightning round here um, as, to finish this out. Here, so the next polling question to the group, the biggest one here. What would make you leave the Pittsburgh region? What would make you leave the Pittsburgh region? This is another ranking, and you have an option of not looking to leave the Pittsburgh region if that is your selection, but. I was really hoping not looking to leave popped up the number one, but it kept dropping. It was a two with the three, now it's at four. All right, here's the, here's the lightning round. Okay, you guys answered a lot of the questions we had coming up here, but uh, it's a highlight reel. So what's one or two things, right? Um, <clears throat> One or two things you think this, this information uh, would be valuable to organizations, missions in the region, and in their use of utilizing the CEIR playbook. One or, two, one or two things as a highlight reel that this information would be valuable in organizations' use of the CEIR playbook. 
attracting them to Pittsburgh, um, giving them the knowledge of what's here and what we're trying to do, um, giving them a real vision of what they're walking into. Uh, being transparent is really key um, so they'll know how to prepare themselves and what to expect. They'll know the expectations in all of these different categories that you just voted and they'll know how to rank them as far as their values and aligning what's important to them and being able to make the best decisions for themselves, I think. Yes, yeah, so I wasn't sure if I fully heard the question, but I think that I get it, so I'm gonna answer um, about the why, why this is important, what people can do with it. So um, I'm, I'm excited about this, I mean, I, you know, not everyone loves sort of research, but I'm a person that really believes in data because data can, can help us to better understand and, priorities and prioritize where there may be issues, needs, concerns, but also opportunities. Um, you know, just really quickly, at the universities, we've been doing some work around what makes faculty, and in particular black faculty, stay um, or want to leave. And before going in, the pretty big assumption was it's going to be about money. That's what everyone thought. And when we think, oh, it's about money, then leaders would say, well, there's nothing we can do about that because these salaries are set and there's nothing we can do, so what can we do now if that's the reason? And then the data comes back, and that wasn't the case at all. I mean, pay was important, but it was further down on the list and issues around belonging and opportunity to feel like your work is valued and matters um, and that you're making a difference and an impact those were all higher than pay. So really having an understanding from a community perspective, giving them voice around what are some of the issues, concerns that are the most important to them, gives the people in this room the opportunity to then really prioritize how to create solutions to address those issues and challenges. And also how to highlight and amplify the things that we're doing well so that we can use that as a strategy and as a draw to bring more people into the region. Sorry, hello. I like to think I'm loud enough to do that. Generally, I am sorry. <laughs> uh, accountability, and that, that's what it comes down to. It can't be just, you know, check the box or, oh, well, there's the next person coming by, tap her. Um, we really need to make the commitment to say, hey, if we have board openings, and I'm not talking nonprofit board openings, those are important as well, but for, pro for profit organizational board openings, there should, it should be mandatory. Anybody that's really buying into this, why wouldn't you say, hey, Cast the net, give me three people to at least go through the process. Because again, how, how many times do you actually get that opportunity? That's where the power lies. Uh, when you talk about your C-suite, it's the same thing. When you know that these roles are coming up, and let's get really super clear, there's no set of circumstances you have a Fortune 500 company where they're going, hey, we're taking applications. That doesn't happen, it doesn't work that way, nor should it. However, you can cast a broader net in regards to giving people the opportunity and experience to know and understand what's expected. If anything else, that helps me know that that's not the job I would think that I want. But it might be something else that I better understand and contribute to the organization in a different way. So again, that accessibility, the accountability in regards to people really making that commitment to say, hey, you have insight at least into the processes, into what it is that it takes, into what it is that you need to understand and actually contribute and be viable for those things. And um, just like the, uh, the playbook and the data that we're getting today, it'll be like um, Joe Friday from Dragnet, just the facts. <laughs> when you actually take this data back to, the, to my board and to your other directors who you work for, they yeah. can't deny this. Exactly. Because one exactly. of the problems in Pittsburgh is that everybody's in denial. Yep. They deny that there's, not, that there's not racism, it doesn't exist, but the data shows otherwise. This data will show that it does exist. And you actually have to start addressing it. But everybody says it doesn't exist, but once again, look at the opportunities, look at our neighborhoods, look at the education system, it's there. Yep. Look at the prison systems, it's there. But this is the data that we need to show them, and they always talk about they feel uncomfortable talking about it, it was even more uncomfortable to live it. Mm -hmm. There you go, there you go. Thank you, thank you. Enough, enough said on that. Thank you so much uh, to the you know, great set of panelists. Can you give them another round of applause here? Thank you so much.